Welcome, this is Chef Jack and video number three. Today we're going to talk about crop production and food systems from chapter 11. Hopefully you are finding my videos somewhat at least educational if not a little bit entertaining. We'll see. <laughs> Alright, so first of all we'll go over learning objectives. We'll describe the historical foundations and current challenges of the farming systems, outline key features of the current crop production in the United States, contrast large, medium, and small scale farming and food systems, discuss emerging production, economic, environment, and social issues in crop production. First, a couple of the little raw details, U.S. crop production, 18% of the surface area, lower 48% of the states, which equates to 357 million acres and in 2012 it was 216 billion in sales and as the book talked about a hundred years really makes a difference because if you dial back 100 110 years how crops were produced and how they are today they're vastly different history we'll look at some of the different farming systems traditional versus industrial it used to be more of a slash and burn people would go to, into an area burn out the air you know, burn down the trees, farm it until it kind of petered out, and then they'd move along. Over time, as farmers started to settle in a little bit more, they'd find more productive and de desirable strains for, you know, better production, better flavor, taste. Came more organized and sedentary about 12,000 years ago. Before that, it was more slash and burn and nomadic, and then after about 12,000 years, people started to settle down in one place and farm just that particular area. More at mutually beneficial relationships. The, you know, the, the farm looked at it more holistically, how everything worked together, what created the most benefits. You know, about a thousand plus years ago, crops, and they realized how animals and crops worked together, how the manure from, from the animals would actually help with the crops. Historically, a small dispersed human population, small scale, Self-sufficient. I mean, most farms or communities were reliant on themselves. They didn't need outside inputs. Saw the relationship between crops and domesticated animals. You know, they provided meat and they also provided labor. Native Americans, and I think, I, you know, I'll expand on this a little bit. You know, the, so there's a name to that, corn, squash, and beans. Does anyone know that name? <laughs> so it's called, what's called the Three Sisters. And then Native Americans did this because they would plant the corn and then the corn would provide a stalk or a trellis for the beans to grow up. And then the squash would grow along the ground, preventing weeds from growing and helping maintain some of the water moisture. So in conjunction, the, the three plants helped one another out to grow and thrive. None of those, or be, some beans are, but not all beans, are complete protein. So complete protein is all 21 amino acids, whereas corn and squash provide some of those amino acids, but not all together in one. But when you eat corn, squash, and or beans together, same with like beans and rice, you end up getting a complete protein. So I think it's kind of interesting how some of these native cultures probably didn't know about amino acids, but they just knew when they ate these certain foods together, you know, those communities or people thrived and survived. But we call, call that, consider that the three sisters. Diverse farming systems, traditional systems. Usually there's multi-species grown together. And as we said, they're mostly self-sufficient. Everything was on the farm. It was provided to them and they maintained it just what resources were on, on the farm. Crop rotation, biodiversity promoted soil fertility. And then the settlers in the 1800s started to bring in new seeds, which they adapted to some of our crops, and then we adapted to some of their new crops and seeds. You know, the immigrants moved westwards and cleared more forests. Prairies were very fertile. The soils had accumulated there for centuries. So when they started to plant stuff, they had, you know, great success. In the south, you had, they were more reliant on slave labor and a lot of cotton for the mills in England. And most of the food was eaten by the farm families or within the communities. And I thought it was interesting about the rail lines. Does anyone remember in the book why there was a kind of a community every 10 miles? 
ding, 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 ding. All right, I'll give you enough time. Um, so if a horse, a farmer load, loaded up a horse in a wagon, it, he could make a round trip, five mile round trip in about a day. So that way, you know, if he was within five miles of a rail station or community, you know, he could make it to that community with going one way five miles and then make it back to his house miles time for dinner. If it was farther, then he, he you know, have to sleep over somewhere. So that was kind of why there was train stops, rail stations every 10 miles because set up for the family farms. So then the emergence of industrial agriculture brought about by the industrial revolution. You know, you went from manpower to horse or animal power. You made a big jump with steam and diesel. Then with those new implements out west, turned a lot of prairies into farmland. But then in doing so over the years, that's what set up and created the Dust Bowl. You know, there's some dry conditions, but then the prairies naturally locked in and supported the water that was in the area. But once it got turned up, no longer able to do that. Thus, we had the dust bowls in the 30s. And then also the book talked about the advent of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. You had the Haber-Bosch process to synthesize nitrogen. And they, with that, they no longer needed cow manure. See, cow manure was a great supplier of nitrogen, so it really worked hand in hand that farms had cows on the farm because it provided a great source of nitrogen. So without the cow manure, you know, that then farms started to move away from having to have animals because a steer or a bull <laughs> can get a little temperamental. And you, so if you didn't have to have a bull around, it made life much easier. And then I talked about the irrigation systems. And, you know, it, all of a sudden, over the years, it was just kind of this technology treadmill. Once a farmer was started to go down that route, then they almost had to keep doing it just to keep up with the next farmers. And a lot of local universities promoted and supported this too. And, you know, and I don't think they really saw what was going to happen in 10, 20, 40, 50 years. They just thought it, this was what we should do. And everyone just kind of did it. Speaking of irrigation, this is a satellite image out in Kansas. And all the circles are from irrigation spigots. So you can see, I'm not sure what each of those squares are, but I would say probably 20, maybe 40 acres. So you'd have either four sprinklers in there or you'd have really big pivot ones. And you can see, you know, how irrigation has dominated the agriculture industry, especially out in the plain states. And now they're running into some issues because they've been doing so much irrigation that they're starting to lose their groundwater or they're starting to fight with local cities about who really owns that groundwater. So this is something with industrial agriculture we didn't you know we just thought you put a well in the ground and you had water forever but that's just not the case. Production methods we've talked about monocrops separate livestocks and food crops so you have farms really producing one or the other. Chemicals reduce the need for you know, hand or tractor. Crops were grown in water poor areas. Increased plant breeding helped with higher yields. We started to notice you've got lower quality grains and, you know, lower quality grains, lower nutrition. So you, you might have the calories, but you don't have the nutrition with it. Also, the, some of the main change, transgenic or GE or GMO crops. So that's where they take and manipulate or splice the genes of one crop one plant and put it into a different plant or animal. Two examples, Roundup Ready or BT crops talked about. In the beginning, these were great boon to the farmers, but now you're getting insects are rebounding. They're able to withstand the Roundup and the BT. It worked for maybe 20, 30 years, but now all of a sudden we've got a problem. And how do you, you know, figure out that cost that you know, I think that's one of those things that are just hard to rectify with this. It's just, you know, in the beginning it looked good, but there's always a cost. There's always something that we don't anticipate. Going on to farm size and management, you know, larger farms, there's fewer farmers. Today's less than 2% of the population. And the social changes, rural communities are declining. Before, money used to stay in the community, and now money passes to the farm, which might be owned by a corporation, which might be in a different state. And then the relevance of genetically engineered crops to sustainable agriculture. 
crops developed through a transfer of genes from one species to another, and that was so-called hybrids. You know, we would naturally transfer the genes from one to another. Then with GE, they took maybe a tomato plant and then crossed it with a corn plant, which would never happen in nature, but genetically engineering that happens. And now 88% of the corn crop is GE and 93% of the U.S. soybeans are GE. And most European nations do not allow genetic engineered foods in their food system or in their countries. But not here in the United States, we, we consume it all. In many cases, it has reduced labor and insecticide cost. And there's a potential for developing varieties adapted to drought, heat, improved nutrition. Um, or you could do it more naturally, which is more, you know, it's just more time consuming, but maybe in the long run, that's actually a better benefit. Farmers can no longer save their seed. There's been a lot of lawsuits out in, in the industry. A farmer used to save their seed, you know, per, part of their production from one year and then use it for the next year. Now with GE seeds, they've got to purchase their seed annually, which is just one more expense for the farmer about the yields it initially decreased but now with the herbs are becoming more resistant to it and then now we're finding out that some of those herbicides impact other animals and other insects big crops that american farmers sent abroad don't have the vitamins or minerals that billions of people need the most and i think that's you know distinguished between calories and nutrition you know we're looking for more nutrient dense food than just empty calories. Talked about exporting corn, which people bought because it was cheap, but then they didn't have any money for you know more nutrient dense foods like leafy green vegetables, milk. Large industrial farms are six to 12,000 acres, and a lot of them are run by families or corporations, outside investors. A lot of them just grow commodity crops produce 70 percent of the food that we eat and then this is interesting too as you know these industrial farms companies like mcdonald's and cisco buy from them but now they're starting to demand that some of their they have go through sustainability audits so that these larger farms are being forced to become sustainable so we could write laws and about it but you know if enough consumers demand more sustainable products then these companies if they want to continue our business will then demand it back onto the farmer. So you can have public policy, but then you can also have just public pressure.